the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for doing so much more than that, God. That not only would you forgive our sins and, and give us a home in heaven, that's complete for every born again person. But dear God, also, you'd give us an opportunity to serve you while we're, while we're here. And you'd give us all we need to do that. You'd send your spirit to live in our hearts. Father, we thank you and we praise you. I thank you for your blessed son. Who alone is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. He's the builder of this church in every, in every Bible believing church. He is the one we'll worship. He is the one who'll judge the world in the last days. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. God in the flesh, who died for us and rose again. And I pray for the filling of your spirit, dear God, to minister this word to your church this morning. Uh, Lord, that we would be edified, that you'd be glorified. Pray for my dear wife for laying the message and sign. Fill her with your spirit and help her relaying that message to your Lord. Thank you already for the time around that your word that we've had, the children in Sunday school and the missionary letters that we've looked at. Consider your working in their lives and our privilege to, to work with them, God. Father, uh, we thank you. We praise you. We pray that now that this portion of the service as well would be pleasing us. Unto your, uh, unto your heart it would be a sweet uh, uh, sacrifice, a sweet savor unto you. Edify your church. Make us soldiers for Christ. Make us stronger believers. Father, might our hearts uh, be loosened from the world more and uh, lay hold of eternal life more. And dear God, in so doing, uh, we'll even uh, enjoy this place more. And so, Father, we thank you, and we praise you, and use us for your glory. Mm -hmm. Do in our hearts what needs to be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. So we are speaking this morning as we continue to look at the armor that God wants us to put on. We are speaking of the sword of the Spirit. There are many illustrations or symbols, pictures in the Bible that God gives to describe His Word. His Word is so, so glorious. It is uh, so majestic that no one symbol uh, could ever describe uh, the Word of God. Don't ever, don't, don't, don't feel like one symbol, symbol is going to cover it. It just can't do it. God, the Bible gives us many symbols. In, in Isaiah 23, 29, it says, God's Word is like a fire that consumes. It's not my Word like as a fire, saith the Lord. And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces fire that consumes, a hammer that breaks, shatters perhaps that hard heart. In, uh, in James chapter 1 and verses 23 and 24, there the Bible tells us God's word is like a mirror. And then you looked at a mirror this morning. <laughs> uh, you look at a mirror. James says, for if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now you all look pretty good. I imagine when you got up, there's probably a few things out, out of order you had to you feel like you didn't take care of before you came here. I think you did a good job this morning. My wife reminds me sometimes, you know. 
<laughs> She'll look at me and kind of raise her eyebrows and go, <laughs> that, that means I've got a you know, rooster tail back here sticking out for, uh, you know, and, uh, and so I've got to take care of it. And sometimes you can't always really see those in the mirror, especially when your hair is short, you know, because uh, getting things right, the Bible's like a mirror. God tells us what? What's wrong with us? Foolish we'd be to not to walk away, man, and not get it right. Uh, it's like a seed. That reproduces. First Peter 1 23, we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's like the milk that those newborn little ones crave. First Peter 1 or uh, First Peter 2 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, you may grow. Thereby. Psalm 119, 105 tells us it's like a light that shines. Thy word is what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. To the saved, it's like a food that cheers the heart. You know, you look forward to dinner, and, and you have that good dinner, and it did, it's just satisfying. It, it's like a food that cheers the heart. Psalm uh, 119, 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Jeremiah wrote, Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. <laughs> For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. The word at times is sweet to the taste, <clears throat> but bitter to the belly. We'll talk about that a little bit today. Revelation uh, 10, 9. John writes, I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. <coughs> said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And he says, He did that, and it was just that. He tasted sweet. Tasted sweet. He ate it. It was bitter in his belly. Let's <coughs> do some of that. See, the fact is, looking at the Bible, it's like, a, it's like a beautiful diamond with many different cuts. When you hold that diamond up to the light, each beauty is reflecting the light of each different cut. No one symbol can communicate the beauty of the whole. That's where the Bible is. So many symbols. And I'm thankful for all those pictures because it helps us understand what this Bible is for us. Well, this morning we're looking at the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're going to see about this sword. But number one, the Word of God is a piercing sword to convict. The Word of God is a piercing sword to convict. You see, in order for God to work in our hearts, to draw us close to Him, there are some truths that we need to realize and be firmly convinced of. If you know what I'm talking about is you consider the plan of salvation, some of those truths aren't easy to swallow, are they? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. 
Those are what? Bitter to the belly, aren't they? Oh. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Revelation 21, 8. Liars is in that list. Oh. Those are bitter to the belly. Bitter to the human nature. And yet, it's necessary to know that. If you don't believe those things, you're not going to be saved. Why would, what would you need to be saved from? God has to show us the truth, even the truth that's painful. And this is primarily where we find the symbol of the sword is used as we're going to, as we're going to study our Bible. I have, through this study, I have, I have tried to limit what I'm preaching on as to what the Bible specifically says about that symbol. First of all, it's a, it is a, it is a, it, the Word of God is a piercing sword to convict. Hebrews 4.12 It's quick and powerful, sharp than any two-edged sword. Here it is. Piercing, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. talking about that. God knows that us deep within. And when you got a wicked heart, like we all have naturally, that's not always a comforting thing. <laughs> that he's always looking at my motives and yours. That he's always seeing my thoughts and yours. That's what that verse is saying in Hebrews 4. See, sometimes, you know, we may have some things going on in our thoughts or motives that aren't quite right. But you know what? Nobody else can see them. I mean, I, I got my suit on, and, you know, and, 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 and I brought my Bible to church today. I look just like everybody else, perhaps. But sometimes we know there's some things going on. So, and we, we take some comfort in the fact that but nobody else can see them. What does Hebrews 4.12 say? Oh no. God has taken his sword and he has laid you and me wide open. And he says, it's just like it is naked and open under me. There ain't nothing hidden from me. I see it all. And by the way, I see it all all the time. It's all laid open before God. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. You might as well, he sees it, amen. We might as well confess it, amen. It's laid open to him. And what? The sword of his word has done that. That's what his word does. It lays it open. How many of you have read your Bible with my hands up and you read that and said, ow. Mm. I gotta repent of that. I gotta confess that. That's what that word does. It cuts us open and lays it out there. Just so that we be reminded, not, not that so God can see it, but so that we be, be reminded that God does see it. You see, he sees it all the time. It is, a, it is a piercing sword to convict. That's why Paul exalted preaching. Because we need to be convicted of our sins before we can be saved. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 19 and following, they have all kinds of gifts going on in the church and some people were not using their gifts right. They were using them in a way that didn't glorify God. And Paul wrote about preaching there, which was a gift, and pre preaching the word. He said in 1 Corinthians 14, 19 and following, everybody's, everybody's speaking in tongues, some foreign language, and, people, and, a, and a lost person comes in, they're going to think you're crazy, is pretty much what he says. They'll think you're mad. 
But he says in verse 24 of verse Corinthians 14, but if all prophesy, that means speak forth the word of God, and they're coming one that believeth not, or one to learn, he is convinced of all. We'll talk about that word in a minute. He is convinced of all. He is judged of all. And here it is. Thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, laid open. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Someone lost comes in and the word of God is preached. The word of God convinces that person. What, what's that word convince me? It means to reprove. Rebuke. To convict. Generally with a suggestion of shame of the person convicted. To call to account. You're accountable. To show one his fault. To demand an explanation for that. You see how the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, has kind of a bitter ministry at first. We have to be confronted with our sin and what's inside of us. And thank God for the sword, amen? Because we need that. We need that. After Jesus preached to the Pharisees, they were intent on murdering him. He said this, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. He is the father of lies, he went on to say. So Jesus used the word what? And the word cut them open. <laughs> In a sense, and the and uh, and 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 then when Jesus got done saying that, uh, say that to them, he said this in John eight forty six, which one of you convinceth me of sin? Which one of you, he says to them, can preach to me about my sin and make me ashamed of sin, of my sin? The the, the rhetorical answer is not a one. Because they couldn't find a thing he'd done wrong because he'd never done a thing wrong. And by the way, his heart was let open before his father too. Every motive, every thought, every intent, always pure. Nothing for him ever to be ashamed of. Amen. I was thinking our, our, our president, one of the things that he said that before, before he got elected, and I'm thankful for the godly things that he's done. Uh, he has passed some godly legislation. I'm thankful for that. But one of the things what he said was, he says, I've never had to apologize to anybody for anything. Well, that's a problem. Because if, if that's true, that means he's not saved. That's part of what repentance is. It's saying you're sorry to God. Because you've sinned against him. By the way, uh, one of the Democratic candidates who just entered the race, I noticed on TV, I saw it and heard about nice, said about the same thing. He's being accused of, uh, of doing some bad, uh, 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 Joe Biden, he's been accused of doing some bad things, and he, his, his comment was, he's never said or done, done anything to anybody that he's ashamed of. <laughs> I thought, wow, there's two now. <laughs> I tell you, you can't read this book too long and, and have that still come out of your lips, amen? Because <laughs> the Word of God is a sword. And he opens that up. And he shows us that. Peter and the apostles were preaching in the temple. And they, they said, Peter, put that sword down there. He says, we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5, 29. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him that God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. And he goes on. We are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost who God had given to them, them to obey him. Verse 33, Acts 5. When they heard that, here it is, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. And that word opened them right up. 
They only had two choices. Get mad or repent. Unfortunately, they, they made the former. That's really, by the way, that's really the only choice we have when God opens up our heart in, 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 to us. You're going to get mad or repent. You're getting harder or softer, one or the other. Yielding to God or harder or harder, harder against it. Stephen, when he preached that sermon, uh, the leaders gathered him before uh, the council, the Sanhedrin, and so many miracles he was performing, great preaching, and the evangelists, they got to stop this. So they call him in and want to make him accountable. Stephen winded down that sermon, Acts 7 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. Who's that? Jesus. Of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. You haven't kept the law. God gave you, you said he leaders of Israel, God gave your nation the law and none of us kept it. By the way, Stephen wasn't saying anything new. He was only preaching to them what the Lord Jesus had already preached to them. That was a repeat sermon, so to speak. He was just preaching what Jesus already preached to him. By the way, their reaction was the same to him at that time, but because of the crowd, they couldn't take him at that time. Here's, here's what Jesus had preached, that, that, that very same thing, really. Matthew 23, 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Ye build the tombs of the prophets and garners the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had the days of our fathers, we would not have been uh, partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Oh, we would never think of slaying a prophet. And Jesus knew very well they were thinking of slaying the Messiah while he was talking to them and planning on it. And he says, you're just like your fathers. Their father was the devil too, by the way. Those false prophets. He says, your witness is unto yourselves, Matthew 22, 31. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, 33. That wasn't, that wasn't very diplomatic. <laughs> Sometimes you, you are called to throw diplomacy out the window. John 7, 19, Jesus said, Did not Moses give you the law of what? And none of you keep with the law. Why go ye about to kill me? Stephen wasn't preaching anything Jesus hadn't already preached to him. He just preached it again. And you know what they did? They hardened their heart again, didn't they? Isn't God merciful? They just murdered the Messiah for preaching a sermon like that. And by the way, now he's raised from the dead and they know it. But they're trying to cover it up. And God sends a preacher to them again preaching the same thing. Amen. Opens up their hearts again. What do they do? They harden it again. And they steal God's prophet. What an amazing thing. That sword does that. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil. But you all some covered it after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, it's really a good thing when the Word of God pierces our heart and shows us our sins. That's a good thing. It doesn't always feel good. But that's a good thing. But if we turn from that, that's a bad thing for us. That's not a good thing. Instead of repenting and getting the benefit of the part of the operation that hurts, if you repent, then there's healing. There's salvation. But if you don't repent, what happens? More sorrows. More piercing. And this time, it's not just going to be how you feel inside. It's going to be the things that sin brings. So the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. <clears throat> they pierce themselves through with many sorrows, those who choose to love money and lay aside mm -hmm. God's word. Not only have to fight that conviction, 
that piercing of the heart saying, you know, that's wrong. But they will face circumstances of life that are piercing mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I, I had a bus physical uh, a couple of days ago and thankful to pass it and have another two years that they're going to let me drive at least. <laughs> and uh, one of the questions they asked was, have you ever had, ever had an operation? And I praise be to God, I have never had an operation in my, had had an operation in my life. How many of you here had, had to have an operation? Hands up. Yeah. Had, and I can understand how that would be, how that would, how that would be painful. Uh, But think about that. Have, have that operation. When the doctor cuts you open, you need to let her remove the cancer. And so you back up. Or else. Uh, I was looking for an illustration of this. I was amazed to find this. <laughs> Lord. Uh, a Russian man, Vladimir, that's like an American named John Smith. <laughs> uh, a Russian man, Vladimir, uh, who's 34, uh, came to the hospital with a knife in his back. I actually saw a YouTube on this. He was stabbed in the middle of his back. But the knife has to be removed with care. So they told him to wait. The doctors and nurses at a hospital at, at Kazan, Russia, stabilized him. They wrapped cotton wool and applied bandages around the knife on his back. They told him to wait on doctors to safely remove the knife from his back. But he refused to stay indoors. It was wintertime, and there's snow on the ground, but this man walked barefoot to go out and have a smoke outside the hospital. <laughs> he made it outside by himself, but he was out of energy and had to be helped to get back into the hospital. Isn't that an amazing thing? Yeah. How foolish would you be, would I be, for God to take his sword of the word, open us up, and show us so, uh, a, a surgery that we need, and we say, no thank you, I, and walk out of the hospital. That would not be wise. <laughs> You see, but here's the good thing. See, God doesn't stab you in the back, does He? Yeah. He doesn't do that. The Word of God diagnoses our sins and reveals them to us face to face and heart to heart, and He also never makes us wait for treatment. Because what's the treatment? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repent right now. God shows it, repent, confess it, get it right. You don't have to sign, sign up for, for, for an appointment. Wait in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you as soon as he can. No. He sh when he shows us, thank God, he shows us immediately we can get it right. What a wonderful thing. The Word of God. <clears throat> repent and believe the gospel. Number one, the Word of God is a piercing sword to convict Number two, the Word of God is a polished sword to continue. Number two, the Word of God is a polished sword to continue. In Isaiah chapter 49, it's speaking prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 49.1 Listen, O Isles. By the way, that's us whom you be sent to. Unto me and hearken, you people from far. Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, and made mention of my name. Isaiah 49 2. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. <coughs> a polished shaft. Verse 6, Isaiah 49. Is it a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Isn't that a great blessing? 
God says to our Lord, I made you like a polished shaft. Isn't that the way he was? It is. You know what? Those who loved him, loved him. Amen. And those who hated him, hated him. Amen. There was no, fence, no sitting on the fence there in that life. He was like that polished shaft. You polish your sword to preserve it from corruption. And so that it can be continually used and fit for warfare. And the Word of God is a polished sword. It is forever preserved from corruption. Psalm 119.89 oh, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. Psalm 12.6 The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, Thou shalt keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Amen. Forever we'll have this sword. Thank you, Lord. We are born again. Not of corruptible seed. It's a polished sword. But of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's not going away, folks. Aren't you glad? Amen. But you know, there's a bitter side to that for the lost. In John, in John uh, 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Wow. Those who picked up this book and their heart was laid wide open. And didn't like that pain. Didn't want to deal with that issue of repenting or not. Believe or not. And they said, no thank you. Put it away. Maybe I'll come back later. They're going to see this book at the end. That's right. They're going to see those words in the end. They're going to come back to them. And that sword's going to be there. And folks, there'll be, there'll be no repenting then. Mm -hmm. The time to repent will be over. If they don't get that right now, they'll see this word again. And it won't be the Lamb at Calvary deliver it. It'll be the Lion, the tribe of Judah. Amen. Delivering. <clears throat> that sword. <clears throat> God knows <clears throat> everything. <clears throat> then thirdly, finally, the Word of God is a penal sword to condemn. The Word of God is a penal sword to condemn. <clears throat> Frankly, everywhere you find this use of the sword tied with the Word of God. It kind of deals with that bitter side. Bringing out that conviction for salvation. And even bringing punishment to those who reject mm -hmm. the love of God. It's, it's a penal sword. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16. John is banished to the Isle of Patmos, and he sees a vision. It's of the glorified Jesus Christ. And he speaks of that vision. Revelation 1.16. He had in his right hand seven stars. The Bible tells us that's the churches. The pastor of the seven churches. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his, and his countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. He's got a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And we'll consider how that sword was used. You see part of it up there already. How was that sword used? Oh, remember what Jesus was speaking even to the churches, to believers, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. He's speaking, he has a message for the churches. John delivered this to the, to, to, the, to, the, 
to the, to the angels of the church, to the messengers of the churches, likely the pastors, the leaders. Deliver this to the churches. In Revelation 2, he's speaking to the church at Pergamos. Revelation 2, 12. And to the angel of the church at Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. <clears throat> I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Now holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things, what? Against you. There's that bitter part. Because thou hast there, there then that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block with the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now, what doctrine was he talking about there? Well, you find that back in Numbers 25 or so. There was a soothsayer, that's not a good word by the way, uh, named Balaam. Remember that story? God made his donkey talk to him. <laughs> the donkey talked and Balaam said, Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Kind of reverse the roles there, you know, uh, which had happened apparently in their hearts. But Balaam, a man uh, by the name of Balak, wants to curse Israel. He offers Balaam some money. Balaam says, oh, uh, yeah, I'll, "I'll come, I'll come and take care of that for you." God bids him to says in the passage, uh, 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 "Balaam, where are you going?" I told you not to go unless they, you know, unless they came for you. And God basically uh, 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 scares him to death. God says, you're going to tell Balak what I tell you to tell him and nothing else. Amen. Because I'll tell you right now, I, all, I just about left your donkey alive and slew you for not listening to me, for going on this trip. And what happened? Uh, well, Balaam blesses Israel like he was told by God for fear of his life. But he no sooner gets back to his homeland. And the Bible says in Numbers 25.1 that the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And at that time, in verse 9 of Numbers 25, uh, there died in the plague 20 and 4,000. They had no sooner got down off the mountain. He gets back to his land, and Balak said, Well, what can we do? Well, we, we couldn't curse them directly, but if you invite them to our sacrifices, they're God again. And by the way, that's exactly what happened. They went and they said, world, come on into the church. Or they said, let's, let's church, let's go out into the world. Let's forget our differences and just all have be in unity and all worship together. You take part in our sacrifices, we'll take part in your sacrifices. That sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. Jesus said, you have that teaching in your church, Pergamos. And also, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, verse 15. Which thing I hate. Now, What was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? That well, was basically this. Well, you're saved. Once saved, always saved. God's more 
concerned about the spirit, not the flesh. There's no good in your flesh. And some of this, there's some truth in what I'm, some of this I'm saying. And so here's why we got to figure it out, these Nicolaitans. There's, there's no hope for the flesh. So if the flesh wants to do something, just do it. Because now you have a spirit and a flesh. You worship God with your spirit, and you, and you can, and you can, you can uh, uh, do with the flesh what the flesh wants to do. And it doesn't matter to God. Does that sound true? No. But that's what they taught. Oh, because you're saying you can just live however you want. Try doing that and not, not coming face to face with God's piercing believer. Mm -hmm. try, try, try that with on for size. Well, preacher, I've done that for a long time, and I've never been, been pierced. Maybe you better check your birth certificate. Because <laughs> yeah. my Bible says God chastens all his children. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. And he says, what did he say? Look at, verse, look at verse 16 of Revelation chapter 2. Repent. Three words. What does it say? Repent or else. There's that bitter side of the sword. This is the sword of his mouth speaking. Repent or else, what? I will come to thee quickly and will fight against them, those teaching the false doctrine within the church, will fight against them with what? The sword of my mouth. I'm going to judge them. I'm going to judge them if they don't repent. If they're saved and, and they're doing that, they need to repent and they may face even up to physical death. If they're not saved, they may die and then go to hell. But I'm going to judge them. They're in the midst of the church. Tied in with the idea of, of judging again the sword. By the way, are we just to do whatever we flesh, our, with our flesh with what we want? Absolutely not. Colossians 3 4. Where Christ is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are on the earth. We're supposed to put our, our, our sins to death. We're supposed to quit doing the things that we did. We're supposed to quit saying the things that we say that, that, that were ungodly. Amen? Putting aside our sins and getting victory over those things continually. Repent or else was the message to them. And by the way, what does Jesus say about the government? Okay. He is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, what? Be afraid. And here it is. For he what? Beareth the sword, there it is again, in vain. Every time the sword is used. He is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You see, every time we take the gospel, in 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the Bible tells us about the Antichrist coming. He's going to come in verse 2.9 2, in 2 Thessalonians 2.10 with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Here's why. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Sometime during that tribulation period, there are those who are going to be deceived by the miracles the Antichrist will be able to do. And the reason will be because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. God is saying is, I will allow you to be, to be signed, sealed, and delivered to Satan himself. Because at some point, they, they at that time in the tribulation, had rejected the love of God and the gospel. And God says that, that he's going to send, send them that, that, that delusion. You see, Every time we bear the gospel, we bear great news. That was the, remember the, the message on the gospel shoes. The bearing the good tidings, the good news, salvation in Christ. By grace through faith, amen. It's wonderful news. There, there's great hope. Uh, that, that helmet of salvation was the assurance of salvation. There's great hope if we receive that message. There's a wonderful, th there's great hope. There's that one side of the message. But just as wonderful as the 
hopeful and good side of the message is when it's received. So awesome and terrible and sobering mm. is the judgment side of the message when it's rejected. Right. Because you don't look that kind of love in the face. You don't look, you don't look the Son of God in the face and that kind of love in the face and say, no, thank you, I'll not have it. Mm. And not face God. Our God, folks, is a consuming fire. And there is judgment. The gospel message comes at the same time with a wonderful, con uh, uh, with a wonderful conversion for those who receive it and a woeful condemnation for those who reject it. The gospel becomes, listen to this, the gospel becomes a seal of God in one of two ways. It is a seal of his, right, of his righteous and pure pardon to those who receive it. And it is the seal of his righteous and pure punishment for those who reject it. It's the same. It's the same. I think in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 6, when those seven angels are headed out, with those with the seven vials or bowls full of God's wrath, and they're about to dump it out upon the earth, the, the worst parts of the tribulation yet, to wind it all down, those seven angels are coming, each one holding a what the Bible describes as a bowl, a vial full of God's wrath. And you know what the Bible says about those angels? They were in, in Revelation 15, 6, the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues. What are they clothed with? Clothed in pure and white linen. Why is that? Because the wrath that God is about to pour out upon the earth is absolutely pure and righteous because of their rejection of God's love. Amen. And folks, God will not step aside from His righteousness any more than He'll step aside from His love. Amen. He will be just as He will. He will give them all the judgment that that, that, that they deserve for rejecting. The love of Christ. The love of Christ. What an amazing thought to ponder. You see, that's kind of the bitter side. I think about this in closing illustration. This judgment is to come. Uh, by the way, it's an eternal judgment. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 9 says, third angel comes out saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. He goes on to say, He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Now, tormented means to vex and grievous, pain, grievous pains. In Revelation 20, verse 10, the, the false prophet and the, and the beast were, had been thrown into this lake of fire the Bible talks about. And uh, in Revelation 20.10, the white throne judgment is unfolding and, and uh, the Bible says, the devil that deceived them, that's the world, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. They've been cast in there a thousand years ago and they are still there now at that time. They, have, they haven't been disintegrated. They haven't been consumed. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The Bible says. That suffering and pain eternally forever and ever in the lake of fire. That's God's... That's the sorrowful side of the sword. Great joy. We can't even express the joy in words of what God does for us when we receive Christ. And I would say to you, we can't even express the wrath and the judgment in words that falls upon those who reject Him. Because God is all God on both sides of the sword. Oh, what a message we have. Do we see? That's why Paul said, who is sufficient for these things? God, we bear such a message. If we speak it, 
and they receive it, they get saved. But, but if we speak it and they reject it, they go to hell and they're tortured forever. I don't know if I can handle bearing that message. Nonetheless, bear it, folks, and go with it, because you're commanded of God. And it is just as righteous of God to, 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 to judge the, the rejecter as it is to save the receiver. And we have to let God be God. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was thinking about uh, <clears throat> this judgment. Some of, the auto, some of the insurance companies have these things you put in your car in there. So you, I think what we call them, uh, 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 Snapshot. Snapshot was one of them, and uh, uh, Allstate has one too. Snapshot was progressive, and All, Allstate had driver-wise, I think. You put this thing in your car, and it, it helps you drive. What it does is it, it, it picks out your faults. <laughs> yeah, when you're braking too hard, you know, and uh, it records that, you know, the G with the GPS and all that. When you're accelerating too fast, whatever, maybe, and it picks up all these things, and you keep it, and eventually you take it in, and you turn it in, <laughs> and they put it in their computer. What? They find out all that you've been doing, you know. And we have, of course, we have the lights at the uh, out of the street at the red lights now. They have the they have the cameras out there, and you know we, we watch for those. You know, you come up to the intersection. The camera, you know, and uh, why? Because we know we know that we can be a, we can be accountable for a record that's been kept, right? If we've been breaking too much and speeding up too much, forget about your insurance break, okay? Uh, matter of fact, uh, they may find, you know may find reason to not have you as an insured anymore. But we fear because of their preserved record. But you know what? There's a preserved record, isn't there? Amen. Right. God has preserved the record. You know, and, uh, and, 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 and every one of our works is going to be tried. <clears throat> and uh, I'm looking for the verse. But, uh, that preserved record. We, uh, I, well, there's a show on uh, TV called Cold Justice. It's where somebody's been murdered or something and, and they never got them. Why? Because they never had enough evidence. <clears throat> And they, and they go back, maybe a case has happened 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And sometimes they will gather enough evidence to actually, because of science that has, has progressed and everything, to actually turn around and convict that person who's been living free, so to speak, for decades, having got away with it then. But you know what? Sometimes they don't. And they have to go back to everybody's everybody's 99.9% .9 sure he did it. But there's not enough forensics, there's not enough witnesses. And they have to go back and tell the family. We, we couldn't convince attorneys to take it to court, there's not enough there. And the person goes off. Folks, that's not going to happen to Big White Throne Judgment. Because God is keeping your perfect record. And he says there's going to be a stack of books. Stacked. So picture all these books stacked up here and uh, stacked up. And, and we have all these books here and they're stacked up. You read Peter in Revelation chapter 20 and the Bible says the books were open. Mm -hmm. And the dead were judged by their works. They were in the books. But there was one book over here. And this is the book of life. And the Bible says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. See, because those who rejected the gospel, here's what they said in their heart. I don't need Jesus. Sure. My works will be okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a pretty good person. Take a look at this, God. And God says, okay, you want to be judged by your works? Let me open up my book. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. How'd you do? Then 
There's no lost people speaking at the, at the white throne judgment. Mm -hmm. And God judges them out of the very books that they wanted to be judged by. Sure. Matter of fact, Jesus said, listen to the mercy of God and the truth of God. He said, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. He's going to use their own words and their own thoughts. It's all going to be open before them. What can you say? You see, because God lacks no witnesses. Everyone who ever known them will, will be there. Every stone that ever saw them do something bad can talk at that great white throne judgment if need be. There's no lack of evidence. And there'll be nothing to say. And they'll know then. By the way, for those who found justice, sometimes they would get the criminal. And they've been running for 10 years. And you know what? It's sweet to the family, isn't it? Because finally, that dear loved one, it's justice. It's sweet. There's a bitter part, too. You can't bring the loved one back. And for us, who are so far from God, and understanding such a creator as God, there's a sweet part in the great white throne. Because ultimate justice is finally done. Mm -hmm. But there's a bitter part too. Mm -hmm. Because we still have a hard time picturing that while we're eternally happy and rejoicing, millions upon millions of countless souls are suffering every moment of every second of their eternal existence forever and ever and ever. And my friend, God is just and right and pure for doing so. Mm -hmm. I think that's why God's going to change us. I don't, I, I don't think we'll be, the Bible says those things of earth, we won't, we won't remember the former things. But that's the sobering side of the sword, so to speak. And God help us uh, in that. When he has that great white throne judgment, there won't be any lack of evidence. And so we can be thankful that we can take that message out. And our God is a God we see who, who drags people. <laughs> you know, I mean, he works them over. Uh, we don't find anywhere where the Bible says that he forces them against their will. Though. We don't find that in the Bible. We find their will yielding. Well, God overpowered their will. Maybe. If so, we don't find that in the Bible. That's the hidden parts we can't see. Man has a free will. God has power to drag them. Well, who made the fire in the season? You don't know. If God, if God did overpower them, we wouldn't know that. We couldn't know that. All we can know is we have to preach it and then have to believe it. And God made it possible for everyone to be saved. That's what we know. And that's the message that we go with. <clears throat> I feel bad. I was going to get some donuts today. <laughs> because, I, because this part of the message was so bitter. I wanted to have, have something sweet for you at the, at the end in a way. But, but uh, well, Fred Myers is right across the street. <laughs> they got him over there. But, but hey, we have a, we have a, a loving Savior. Amen. This is his judgment. is unfathomable. If we admit it, his love's unfathomable too. Mm -hmm. That he would go through that for us. And there's not one reason. God didn't make hell for human beings. Mm -hmm. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, the Bible says. And there's not one reason anybody should go there but by their own choice. Mm -hmm. Everybody who does, does so by their own choice. And, and, and all the while even breaks the heart of God. Though he will be true to his justice. We can be assured of that through the scriptures. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today. The message this morning is it's not one of those easy ones to preach, God. I do, but it brings glory to your name because it's the Bible. And it shows us the importance of eternal things. Uh, Lord, this world is going to pass away and everything on it. Dear God, it's, it's going to be melted down and you're going to make a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. You're going to purge this old planet universe of the filth that sin has caused. 
throughout it. And you're going to make a new universe from this one after you have melted it down. New heavens, a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. We'll be made as much as the image of your dear Son as we ever will be. We'll be in, the, in your presence as fullness of joy. And our joy is forevermore. And we'll be with you. And I pray you help us to share the gospel with others that they too may believe and be saved and have the hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life. Uh, that they not uh, refuse the conviction that sword brings and have to face the condemnation that will follow. That they might yield to that conviction and experience that blessed conversion that comes to all who simply trust in you. Father, help us to be careful to thank you and praise you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. Amen. Stand and we'll be closed with song.